I thank you for the service, Stephen. I just want to say that uh, it really moves me to see the theater back tonight. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many here have seen Dune Part 2 before? I told you. <laughs> that is great. Well, it's an honor for me to sit here and talk to you. We know each other, but this is the first time that um, I've had a chance to ask you questions that uh, in front of a very large public and also with a lot of brethren from the Directors Guild of America. Uh, how many here are at, with the DGA? Yay, okay, okay fantastic. Um, so let me start by saying that there are filmmakers who uh, are, builder, are build, the builders of worlds. And we know, it's a, not a long list, but we know who a lot of them are. You know, starting with Melier, and of course, Disney, and um, Kubrick, builder of worlds, George Lucas, George Powell, Ray Harryhausen I include in that list, Fellini built his own worlds, Tim Burton, obviously, Wes Anderson, Peter Jackson, James Cameron, Christopher Nolan, Ridley Scott, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, the list goes on, but it's not that long of a list. And I deeply, fervently believe that you are one of its newest members of that list. But world building is not an acquired skill. You have to have had an exotically imaginative childhood. Denise, what was your childhood like that brought you here? Actually, it was boring. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, I, I won't go into therapy, therapy sessions, but the, 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 the idea of, uh, of being in contact at a very early age with uh, uh, graphic novels coming from Europe uh, called Metal uh, uh, or like uh, um, with, with authors like Bilal, Drouillet, Mézière, uh, Moebius. I was like uh, drawn into, at a very early age, uh, reading the, and uh, these guys created. If you're talking about world builders, yes. they, 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 these are the founding fathers of, of, uh, of science fiction, of modern science fiction, of the, uh, and uh, um, I, I, uh, I think I was put in that water too early. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, uh, but you know, and, and of course, you know, go way back and we talk about not so far back Arthur Clarke and you, I mean there's there are so many you know Heinlein there are so many world builders in literature and science fantasy and science fiction um, but this is a desert loving story I think there's a line of Lawrence Arabia about you know why do you love the desert and what does T.E. Lawrence say because it's clean mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is actually that, uh, that, uh, <laughs> But, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. But, but, but just for such a desert-loving film, uh, there is such a yearning for water in this movie. For all the sand you have in this film, it's really about water. You know, you know it's, it's, it's just, you know, the sacred waters that, that are yearning for green meadows and, and, and the blue water of life. Uh, you know, you film the desert to resemble an ocean, a sea. The sandworms were like sea serpents. And that scene surfing the sand, sandworms is one of the greatest things I have ever seen, yeah. ever. Yeah. But you made the desert look like a liquid. And, and I have to ask you how you and Greg Fraser, your DP, captured this because just the definition of the dunes, did you have to do it leaned in on Lawrence Arabia? Did you have to wait uh, for the very early morning hours for your shots or just a very late day when the sun was low to get the the amazing pictorials that yeah that uh, we really structured uh, we didn't use any artificial light in the desert the idea was and that's why we shot it with uh, uh, digital because I, I wanted to go in very very low light we, we were able to shoot it's amazing with those cameras you can shoot uh, the sun uh, the sun is gone and you still can shoot 45 minutes or it's it's like really uh, you go we went very dark um, it's in on film here, and, and um, the idea was that each scene, specifically, it was in the screenplay. Of course, the, the, at specific moments, having spent a lot of time in the desert and, uh, and knowing uh, the impact of the, the, the sunlight, uh, we uh, shot uh, specific scenes. That it created a, a real puzzle in the schedule, meaning that we were starting uh, some specific scenes early in the morning, 
uh, jumping into another scene the rest of the day and finishing uh, doing the X scenes at the end of the day, like the kissing scene, for instance, is done over four or five days that were shot at a specific hour of the day to keep continuity and uh, uh, which specific sand dunes that had the per perfect orientations each dune. It was like a strange, the strangest casting I did in my life, those sand dunes, because, and we looked, Greg and I, like madmen, you know, the, the, trying to find the specific shape in the specific orientation according to the specific time. And Greg used the uh, uh, Unreal Engine to, um, to capture some uh, sets uh, uh, on computer to be able to calculate very specifically at what time you should do with each shot. You get really nerdy with that, <laughs> with uh, calculating, but it was super precise to, uh, to achieve what we wanted to do because we didn't want to compromise. So you didn't have any actors that were having just said, I'm not coming out of my dressing room, it's too hot or anything? No, were... actually, uh, there was no dressing room. The, the, the... <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, they, no the, uh, I'm, I'm joking, but the, because it was like a, a tremendous Fantastic, I must say, uh, infrastructure, the logistic in Abu Dhabi was amazing. Because you needed, uh, as you shot in the desert, you need a lot of support for the crew. And it, uh, it's, qu it's quite amazing what they done. They created eco-friendly uh, uh, roads that are not existing anymore as we speak, but, uh, but uh, they were like, to maybe I think 18 miles of roads were designed in the desert. And, and then there were tentacles of side sidewalks that were like, uh, created for the crew and it was like a tremendous amount of uh, logistics so it's, uh, but actors were um, you know what they were uh, so generous but it's the thing the impact of the landscape everybody were getting back to the hotel exhausted but a smile you know because the, 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 we've seen things there that were absolutely stunning every day it was like uh, and you're talking about water the desert being uh, an absence of water but it, there's a lot of water in the desert actually it's, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's a seabed once. Yeah, exactly. And, but uh, in the atmosphere, and then there's like a, it's a landscape that is very moving because it's so, it's like uh, at and the surface, it's, it's an image of death, but there's so much life in it and that's really moving. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about religion because Dune and Dune Part Two make such a statement about religion. Um, those in the South, we remember, you know, they, they, they think the next Messiah will come, and the, the freemen in the North don't entertain such notions. Um, you know, Stig El Silgar, Javier Bardem, uh, he's from the South, and he's ready to pledge his life in support of Paul as the Ulsa Mahdi, you know, uh, the, the Mati, the Messiah. And Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, is, is going to become the Reverend Mother. Um, can you speak about your background and upbringing as a Quebecois? Yes. Uh, that focused your film, another Quebecois right over there. <laughs> focus your film on, on these themes. That, um, in, in the, the, I, I just need to explain first that when the, the, the first novel came out, Dune, Frank Herbert was disappointed by the way it was received because uh, he felt that some reader thought it was a celebration of Paul Atreides as he, want, he was intending to do the opposite. He wanted to write a cautionary tale uh, against messianic figure. Uh, he wanted the book to be a warning, but the, uh, uh, feeling that he has some uh, missed the point, or the, he wrote a second book called Dune Messiah mm -hmm. to, to correct and to make sure that uh, the idea was very clear that Paul was a dark figure, that he was like, a, and he was a dangerous, he, was, he became a dangerous figure. So knowing that, John Spate and I, we wrote this, uh, this film trying to be faithful to Frank Herbert's initial desire, which is once that to make that the film would be a condemnation of, of a colonial, religious colonialism, and, and that Paul would become uh, uh, something that he should not become. And, and, the, and in order to do so, I use Shani, uh, the, the Fremen warrior Shani, that is like a, a character that in the book is uh, more in the, in the background. In the second half of the book, and I brought it up at the surface, and I, I, I had in mind, uh, coming from my background as a Quebecois, the idea of uh, in the '60s, there was like a, a, a movement. In fact, it started at the eight of the fifth, at the eight of at the, the '40s, a movement uh, of, uh, that came from artists, young artists, uh, that the, that uh, figured out that thought that uh, the church was a Catholic church 
was too embedded into the politics uh, uh, before the 60s where I'm coming from church was uh, in power I mean they were deciding they were saying to people if you vote for those people you go to hell mm -hmm. if you vote into the, the, this the, this politician is paradise it, it, and it's not a caricature what where I'm going is that they have tremendous power and religion of course is a very important thing and, and meaningful and, and powerful but when you blend it with the politics, it can be uh, dangerous. And I, it was at home. Uh, and and it is it, it, what happened in the 60s, it's called a quiet revolution, where young intellectual decided to uh, create a, a separation between the state and the church. And that quiet revolution inspired me to create that session in the Fremen, that the Fremen would not be a, a monolithic block, but there would be different current of thought and the youth like to be independent uh, uh, from those beliefs coming out from outer space. But the Mati, Paul is heading toward fundamentalism yeah. and is on his own journey. Yeah. You know, just the, just, just the, uh, what happens when you are followed and when so many people follow you and what it does to your sort of outlook on the world how it skews that outlook often. I mean, I can't wait for number three because you're going to answer all these questions. I know that. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> wait for that. Um, I'm interested in talking a little bit about the spice because uh, is this, is this, is, is the movie sort of saying that, that, you know, the war against the spice industry, is that anything like the, um, the environmental war being waged today against the oil industry to sort of save our planet? Is spice an environmental threat that's blocking the greening of the desert, or is it the politics of war between the Freemen and the Harkonnens? The Har Har Harkonnens. Um, although, because spice seems to be the fuel of all intergalactic travel, so it, cer it, it certainly serves that function. It's always uh, the notion of greed, I think, at the end of the day, is uh, the over, over, overuse, of, uh, uh, over exploitation of it, that is the problem. I think, uh, I think that capitalism on uh, his own term is okay, it's just the over. Uh, and um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's really the, 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 the exploitation of it, that the resources, over exploitation, that is the problem. Yeah, because it was like it was like you know what do they call that sort of open mining, and uh, and and those machines were incredible. I thought the machines were incredible in the first Dune, but I don't know what you did, but you did something to detail the more this time with the sand falling off the the treads. I mean that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. In the in the first movie they were in the sandstorm. Now they were in bright sunlight, so we had to go a bit more. <laughs> you, we were able to afford more. Warner Brothers paid for more pixels <laughs> of the success of the first film. It's good to have more pixels in our business. Very very, very good. Um, I, I think images tell the story of Dune Part Two even more than the wonderful words that you wrote and your and your writing partner wrote. Um, but this is truly a visual epic, and, and it, it is also filled with deeply, deeply drawn characters, and yet the dialogue is very sparse when you look at it proportionately to the running time of the film. And I'm curious because so much of this is such, is such cinema that I was interested in how you could communicate your vision. I had this problem with Close Encounters. My cast didn't know what the hell I was doing, and, and, and that was a long time ago. But, but how were you able to communicate with your cast how you saw, saw the story being told through your lens? Because they're not through the lens, only you're through the lens, and Fraser's through the lens. And, and were they able to share your vision during production? I mean, did they have to read Herbert over and over and over again? How did that work? It's, it's a good question. I never thought of that. I really didn't understand. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing that tremendously helped, and uh, sorry it's a boring answer, but it's uh, artwork. Mm -hmm. Patrice, my production designer, did a tremendous amount of artwork to describe the world, to describe the, 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 the sets. I mean, the sets were constructed, but sometimes with the extensions. Of, there was a, a whole uh, uh, visual research that was done. And um, so I, I think that was trying to feed them visually as much as possible. And it's, uh, the screenplay was still... Uh, the description, I think, was were uh, quite uh, solid. So, uh, and again, we we um, uh, 
but you have the same thing on the close encounter. I mean, uh, you, you shot everything on camera mostly. Uh, uh, yeah, but nothing was there for anybody to react to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were looking at they were looking at large cards with numbers written on them, dangling ninety feet over their heads, yeah. and through a bullhorn, we would I would call out the numbers so I could get four hundred extras to move their eyes at the same time across the sky. It was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> But you work with great actors, that's the, that's the key, I think. Huh? Were there any, I just a weird question, I just thought this up, but were there any actors on your film that you think will be directors that were kind of like over your shoulder, wanting to see through the lens, really curious about how you were styling your shots? The truth, there's one that spent a lot of time, there's someone that spent a lot of time behind the camera, listening, listening, it is Zendaya. Yeah, 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 she's so clever, but she's, she's brilliant and she's a strong presence and she's always, always on set, even when she was not uh, shooting, just sitting be, be, between uh, Greg and I and listening, listening, listening. So I would not be surprised that one day we we learned that she wants to go behind me. See if Senda is available, correct? <laughs> <laughs> eight million dollars, okay. Um, thank you. I didn't ask that question for any other reason except I was curious, but thank you for the answer. <laughs> Look, I found, I found the shots in this film, I'm sure we all agree, they were so painterly. There's not a single a angle, or there's not a single setup or tableau that's pretentious, not one. And there's a tremendous balance. In, in the first Dune and Dune Part Two, even more than some of your other films, between wide establishing shots, we know exactly what's happening, where we are, and then going all the way into these tight studies, these super, super close-ups, and yet you relieve that in seconds, you go back out wide again. The film is all master shots and all close-ups, and I think that's just absolutely, I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, but it's, it's based on, on the, uh, no, uh, thank you, it, but it's based, uh, uh, it's from the book. The book is a very interior book. It's like, uh, when you read the book, it's dialogues, dialogues, and uh, inner dialogues, and people, uh, you have access to all the inner strategy of the characters, and I tried to convey that by creating a very strong intimacy with the characters, and to be as close as possible to Paul, and to his, his emotional experience, his intimate experience. And and uh, right at the start, uh, one of the first decisions we've made after shoot the, the idea to shoot in IMAX was, I said to Larry, I want to go extremes, to have the, the impact of the landscape on the soul. And so I tried to do that, that, uh, that uh, to play with the, those extremes like that, to, to convey that. Right, and, and, and the, you know, and, and there was also, it was so interesting to Tib, really, because this is so much about the, this is so much, this is very, such a spiritual film, and there's so much in the eyes of everyone. I mean, I mean, you go deeply, deeply, you do studies into their eyes and how they're feeling, and, and every single character has that moment. You know, the good guys, the bad guys, they're all, you know, you know, treated very, very equally. We all get to make our own value judgments about them. But I think the, the just the tableaus of the close-up, the visual studies of the faces were just extraordinary. Uh, and you were talking earlier about conceptual art that helped the cast understand the tone of the film. Were there individual storyboards that you had? Did you have tons of storyboards? I, I, I started the storyboard uh, almost at the entire movie because I, uh, the way I I I wrote this wrote the screenplay, and after that, uh, it's always I'm probably the most important moment for me is to be alone with my storyboard artist, and I spend weeks and weeks, if not months, drawing the whole movie, where uh, that's where the mise en scène uh, is born, the the language, the the a lot of props, a lot of costumes, a lot of sets are that I love, and that's where I then I come go and I rewrite the screenplay from the storyboards. Because there, there's always massive difference between the. It's it's strange when the you go from the world to the image. There's a process where suddenly you face the reality of the, the limits, or the new ideas are born. Storyboard is probably one of the most important moments. And I I I started to make. I would not say make movies. You started making movies using a, a, a super eight camera. Me, yeah, I didn't have a camera. I had a friend with a good pencil and a good, and and my first movies were drawn. And and I always the, the it was always the, the way I started to dream about film was by drawings and I again I'm talking about the graphic novels when I was a, a kid 
So the, the idea of the drawing is very important in my process. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, because I, I work the same way in, in, in the sense that isn't it interesting that we have a script and we we're, we're, we're going to certainly rely on the script, it's the document, <clears throat> it's going to take us through the whole narrative production. But then you start storyboarding and you get to the point where you storyboard beyond the script, you forget you've written the script and suddenly you've written a whole new script in storyboards and you have to go back and conform the writing on the page to the storyboards? Yeah, exactly, that's exactly, exactly what I do, I rewrite. And then there's a, there's a saying on set is that the, the storyboard supersedes the, the screenplay. It's always the team has to follow the storyboard, not the screenplay. But on set, nature supersedes the storyboard. So what happens very often is we take the storyboards, we throw them, and we improvise because there's something happening in the desert that wasn't planned. It's always the best moment, frankly. I have to ask you about the stunt calving. Who did the who did your stunt calving? Especially the fight between Austin Butler and oh, Timothy Chalamet. Roger, Roger Yuan. Roger Yuan, that is a specialist of martial arts, and that uh, uh, blended different uh, combat uh, uh, style inspired. In fact, we were trying to find each tribe has its own way to fight, and and uh, Roger is uh, there's a sub -study storytelling in each movement. It's very precise, and, and it's uh, it's beautiful too. He's much more interesting than me when it comes to talk about the uh, fighting movements, or because he, he could explain each fight. There's a sub story to to, to all. It's very beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I just think this has one of the greatest fighting in it, and. Um, you know, I know I had the privilege of knowing David Lean uh, for a number of years. <clears throat> when Marty Scorsese and myself and and um, Ro Ro uh, um, Robert Robert Harris, sorry Robert Harris, we found out that Sam Spiegel had cut 22 minutes out of Lawrence of Arabia after the film was released, and Robert Harris discovered the negative in a pinball a disused pinball factory in New Jersey. And when he discovered the missing footage, Spiegel, the producer, had cut out of the film. Marty and I went to Don Steele, who's the head of Columbia, and we pleaded with her to let us restore Lawrence and put the footage back in after David Lee said, please help me raise the money for this. So I got to know David through that. And, um, and which meant that um, when the film was finished, when David did all the ADR in London with a lot of the surviving cast and got some voice doubles for the cast members who were no longer living, David came out to LA and invited me to watch Lawrence Romeo sitting right next to him. I got to sit next to him at the big theater in Columbia. I got to see it uh, with him, with David. And the only problem was David talked all the way from the <laughs> <laughs> beginning to end. Now, the film's now like 340, you know, and he's talking through the whole film. And the reason I, I'm giving you this setup is um, one of the things he most wanted to talk about was how I got rid of the footprints in the sand after take one, for take two. And he said, first they tried to bring in long poles with brushes, but when you try to brush out the footprints of the camel tracks and the, and the, and the footprints, it smeared the sand, it didn't look natural. So they had to let nature do it. They had to shut the film down after take one. Everybody goes back to their bivouacs, their tents, and the next morning, the the nature's done the job, and they get a chance for take two. Did you have any of that, or th that on your film, or did you use digital tools to help you? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, uh, um, because it's hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's first, you have to, it, it requires a tremendous amount of discipline for the film crew to where they're going to, uh, according to the scene, sometimes you will choose specific sand dunes for their the way they're with, so you can take one is there, take two is there, take three, and 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 uh, it's true. And yes, and um, also we uh, we choose also the, according to the shots, the strategy to do the shots also. But it's true if you broom, it's it doesn't look natural. So and the problem is not, of course, we can erase in CGI the footsteps in the background sometimes. But if the character uh, 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 walks in his own footsteps or in foot, then it creates a, a problem with, with CG because of so uh, uh, the most strange and beautiful thing I've seen I think as a filmmaker uh, is to when you leave the set at sunset the sun uh, uh, and you see an army of people starting to broom the sand dunes behind you because then the next morning you have to broom them and they develop good techniques to the, the, they are 
we call them the greens, but there's no, 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 no greens in the desert. But the sand people, they, they were expert, the broomers broomed. And then, that, but we have, it's true, you have to wait for the sand, the, the wind to do that job. The only way was the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, because David was saying that the wind puts the waves in, in the sand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just like water, just like ripples on water, except the waves stay there. Um, that, that was just amazing. Um, and I, I think the casting of this film was absolutely remarkable. Everybody feels like they were born, born to play those characters, everyone. I, I have just a one question. That uh, uh, So it means that the version that I've seen of Lawrence of Arabia is the one that you... Uh, uh, restored. Yeah, restored. Yeah, that's, that's the, the one that we restored. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, but the one that I, I, I've seen it probably in, in 1987 um, or That was the one, yeah, it was late, late 80s, <laughs> that was the one. Thank you. <laughs> because, I don't know, but I recommend that if ever you have the chance to see Lawrence of Arabia in 70 millimeter, yeah. I remember I was a film student, I was 19 years old, I had seen that, that movie, I was alone in the theater at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I, it's one of, still to this day, it's one of the most powerful experiences. When you are a film student, it's like a massive master class on filmmaking. I, it is. It is. All of his films are master classes. Um, the Rare Breed I just saw on TCM the other day, you know, his first movie not with Noel Coward co-directing, but his first solo outing, and it was all the signals that showed what David Lean was going to be or were there in that film. Um, but I was just saying how great the casting was, everybody, you know, don't have to, when you were writing the script, was any single actor in mind during the writing of the first two? Uh, Stellan Skarsgård, uh, Timothée Chalamet, of course, um, uh, Stephen uh, King uh, Anderson, Stephen Anderson was a, um, well, sorry, I'm, uh, there's so many. Uh, and uh, Javier Bardem, too. Uh, I had in mind. Yes, yes, yes. He was extraordinary. Second, I saw your movie. I, first person I wrote to was you. The second person was Javier. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left, so let me just try to get through a few more of these. Um, did, you, did you use some of book three and book two? Because I remember in book three, isn't that where Paul rides the sandworm for the first time? No, no, no. Was, was that was that was in book two. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay, in, it's okay. In, the, in this first book, it's like yeah. Right, right. Um, was anything moved forward from the third book to the first two films? Not really. Uh, uh, I think that uh, apart from the idea that I know that uh, it was important for Frank Herbert that Paul would be seen as as uh, uh, someone that uh, when in the dark zone. Uh, it's like, uh, and uh, so the movie in a way is more depressive and more uh, uh, as a darker tone than the, the book because at the end of the book, uh, when you read the book, you look at it from a certain perspective. Paul uh, uh, avenges his father, wins the war, and get, get all the girls. You know, like, <laughs> it was, I don't think that Frank was, was a, <laughs> I think he, he it was not his intention. Were not that clear. I'm making a stupid joke. Sorry, but it, it was not his intention. Was were not that clear. And I think I understand why, he, uh, knowing the story, he wrote to Messiah after that. That yeah. the, the uh, you know the story. Your story has so much to do with visions and dreams and trusting your dreams. There's a theme running through, at least running through for me, about you have to trust your dreams, no matter how off-putting or terrifying they are. And and. Um, yeah, we, when we got to the section, and I knew about this going in, but we got to the section with Lady Jessica in conversation with her unborn child. That was really wicked weird. I, I, I mean, that, that, was, that was amazing. And I kept thinking, oh, wow, they're, they're really in, locked in conversation here when uh, uh, Aaliyah is born eventually. Is it going to be like Amy Heckerling's film, Look Who's Talking? I mean, I mean is, she going to, is she going to come out, before we see Anya, is she going to come out with full paragraphs? <laughs> I want to see that scene. But it, 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 it was an interesting idea that came up uh, as we were writing that we will not see the birth of Alia because it's a thing in the, in the book. The, the, uh, Alia, is a, there's a, the book happens on the, on the moral. A period of time that's a bit longer, and uh, uh, John and I we wanted to compress time in order to put to put more pressure on Paul, and and uh, the idea that uh, we will follow uh, a female camera, a woman that uh, will be pregnant, not seeing the I thought it it was like a very powerful figure, and and something that I not 
really see. I think uh, I, I, everything has been done. Don't get me wrong. But the idea that I, I was fascinated, uh, you know, um, for me, pregnant women are very powerful, and mm -hmm. there was uh, there was something about that strength and that power that I was really happy to put in a sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. well, what do you what do you what do you call the wisdom? Is Betty Jesuit? Yes, sir. Yeah, and that's the deep wisdom that she possesses, and also Paul possesses because of the. His, his past and his actual roots. Yeah, it's, it's the idea that uh, in order to make sure that you can have the full power of your, your intuition, you have to know where you're coming from and knowing the, 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 the tapping into the, the, all the genetic uh, uh, heritage. And, uh, and that's the uh, idea of Bayard Herbert. I tried at my best to be away from uh, fantasy, meaning that I tried uh, uh, in, the, in that context to try to be as... Uh, Plausible that uh, everything you can almost explain everything apart from the fact that this is a super powerful reaction to that substance that is the spice. Uh, you can almost uh, uh, explain everything. Uh, I love the idea that uh, Paul is not a messia, messianic figure, really, it's just that this the context and uh, all the, uh, the, way the other people perceive him and, and all the power they put on him. It's that he doesn't have any really magic power, I mean, about, apart from being uber sensitive to that substance, I, 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 like a uh, spice almost like LSD or something like that, but, uh, and he, it, it enhances his uh, intuitions. Well, this has been wonderful, and I, I, you have made one of the most brilliant science fiction films I have ever seen. Uh, Steven, thank you. It's, it's, And, and that is a massive compliment coming from you, so I thank you everybody. Thank you.